Okay, everyone. Looks like we're at the top of the hour, so uh, time to get started. Um, welcome to this uh, session on social aspects. Uh, my name is uh, Chuck Wallace. I'm at uh, Michigan Tech University in the United States. Um, we have four uh, present presentations for this session. Um, we're going with uh, five minutes for, for each presentation, so uh, we'll have a quick discussion and then our quick presentation and then um, an open session where we, we talk about all of the um, everything we've, we've heard so far. So um, yeah, let's uh, let's get started. Uh, our first um, our first speaker, first speakers are uh, Nan Yang and uh, Alexander uh, Sur uh, uh from uh, Eindhoven. And can you get the yes. screen sharing and everything working? Yes. Uh, let me share my screen here. Yes. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Great. Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nanyan, a PhD student from Eindhoven University of Technology. So, our research study is based on the observation that there are more and more software foundations uh, created. So, these foundations host many uh, open source projects, and often by joining uh, these foundations, these open source projects need to donate their source code and follow the rules set by the foundations. So this triggers a uh, question. So why would these open source projects want to join software foundations rather than just operating by their own? So understanding the reason behind the decision can help us uh, understand what open source projects expect from software foundations and help foundations provide better assistance and more inclusive environment for projects to grow. So in this study, uh, we investigate the motivations for joining uh, Apache. So Apache is one of the world's largest open source foundations. So by, doing, uh, by studying this foundation, we hope to learn the motivations from uh, different kinds of uh, open source projects. So we investigated uh, three research questions. First, uh, we study the primary organizational and geographical characteristics of the donated projects to understand uh, the diversity of such uh, ecosystem. Um, we then studied uh, what motivates uh, these projects to join the Apache. Uh, answering this question provides an overview of the expectations from um, different kinds of uh, open source projects for software foundations. And next, we study uh, to what extent uh, these projects have uh, different uh, motivations. Understanding the commonality and differences among these projects can help uh, foundations to optimize and prioritize uh, their services. So in Apache, uh, every project with the intention to join has to submit a project proposal which states uh, their technical and non-technical background, motivations, goals, and status. Uh, we studied this uh, question by uh, conducting qualitative analysis on 292 uh, project proposals. Um, based on our analysis, first we found that uh, America-based uh, projects are still dominant, but there is a growing trend uh, for uh, Asia-based project. Um, and the main contribution of this study is the derived uh, motivations from uh, project proposals. So in total, we have identified uh, 28 uh, motivations, which are further grouped into uh, 10 high-level uh, categories. And here we would like to highlight uh, the most common motivations, which are uh, related to uh, community, outcome, interactions, and technical development. So it is expected that projects, of course, would like to foster uh, their community with the help from uh, foundation. Among this motivation under category uh, community, community diversity has been mentioned by uh, 149 projects. However, interestingly, most of the projects refer to um, different companies contributing to the project rather than to the demographic uh, diversity of uh, developers. 
And secondly, we observe that uh, projects would like to increase their uh, impact, visibility, and foster innovation, which are not widely discussed in previous uh, study about open sourcing uh, projects, pro uh, software projects. So for our search research question, we found that there are more company-based projects uh, in Apache. However, uh, companies and non-companies projects are roughly the same uh, in terms of uh, their motivations. So this commonality leads us to suggest uh, the foundation should focus on meeting the common uh, expectation from different uh, projects, helping them uh, foster community, increase user base, improve uh, outcome, interactions, and technical uh, development. And since we uh, have seen a significant uh, increase of Asia-based projects, uh, especially in the recent year, um, we suggest software foundations focusing on more, um, more on providing tools and techniques that can support communications and interactions between projects coming from uh, different cultural background or using different uh, languages. So uh, with the result that we have, we suggest researchers to further um, help open source projects better decide whether joining a foundation could be beneficial for them. So we suggest uh, researchers to study the effectiveness of uh, incubation in software foundations as the next step. So for example, it is interesting to further study what kind of uh, guidance and governance do software foundations um, provide and to what extent were that uh, effective to help a project achieve their goals. Yeah, so this is a short introduction of uh, our research. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Nan. And uh, we'll we'll have we'll take questions sort of at the at the end um, with the, the in the open session. Uh, yeah, uh, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Good. Uh, let's see. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, uh, Isabella Gressel from University of Passau. Thank you. So I'm also going to share my slide. Okay. okay. Yes, right. So. Okay. So. Hi everyone, I'm Isabella Grossen from the University of Passau uh, in Germany and today I will show you that Scratch is more than just a programming platform for beginners and that it can be analyzed like a social network. And uh, therefore we just want to know, okay, how can social network analysis and Scratch link together? Um, we've learned from recent events such as the Black Lives Matter uh, movement that societal issues have indeed an impact on the software engineering community, for example, replacing certain discriminatory terms. And we see this phenomenon not only in a professional context, but also in uh, browsing through projects of the popular educational platform Scratch. And then we realize, or at least I'm realizing, okay, in general, what do we really know about the interests of this young programmers what are they talking about in their projects and in their programs and since the environment is really similar to a traditional social network of liking loving sharing projects and also commenting uh, we want to extract some semantic information um, from the from the scratch projects and see to which extent um, the the yeah societal issues have an impact on scratch projects. So first we want to see uh, which topics can be extracted from the Scratch projects and therefore we contacted um, the application of automated uh, text analysis using machine learning techniques um, top to back here in this case for over 100,000 projects of the Scratch domain. And second we wanted to know okay uh, which society or which social behavior exists in the scratch com comments. So what is the tone of the scratch comments? Are there more negative or more positive comments about the projects? And so we analyze project comments with a multi-class sentiment analysis tool. It's called Wader with, uh, for over 16,000 projects. And what we did 
get. There uh, was a lot of topics with some kind of music and animal stuff within and um, also a lot of topics with noise and inconsistency, kind of what we expected. Um, but uh, we also identified some uh, topics with proper names. So, for example, here you can see Sharky Shaw. It's a YouTube channel. It's more for the younger people of us. Um, also, like Canadian ch uh, children's television networks are occurring. Uh, but you can also see COVID as a term here, and uh, it's the term of the highest weight in this topic. And this indicates that the extraordinary event um, of the COVID pandemic is being processed, at least in some form, in the users' projects. Besides that, we also have just common everyday life scenarios, such as holidays and celebrations, as you can see in the terms Christmas, Halloween, or birthday. And what we also did get was a lot, a really lo a lot of uh, cultural and net cultural um, topics. So with the terms, sorry, um, with the terms Mario and Pokemon, these are um, like inter internet phenomena and also games. Um, we also saw Harry Potter and Disney. And this implies that children transfer their favorite free time activities to the programming setting, uh, which could be beneficial to design programming tasks for. And we also identified some real abstract worlds, such as rather gloomy fantasy worlds with dragons or Godzilla in it. And also some, yeah, I would say rather shiny fantasy worlds with uh, unicorns and rainbows, um, which also could be um, beneficial for designing tasks. Um, so for the sentiment analysis, the good news first, the majority of the 14,000 projects is positive, and here you can see some of them, um, and it's dominated by the term thank, which is really intuitive because it's a sign of appreciation. We also see some other strong positive words such as love and best, and also acronyms like LOL or XD for the uh, more older people of us, it's a sign of youth slang which is due to the age of the Scratch user and only can be interpreted by the certain age group. In contrast, we also saw some negatively connotated comments. Um, and this is really uh, interesting because you also see the, the acronym BLM, it stands for Black Lives Matter, as you know, um, and also some kinds like uh, people, police, police, racist or black can be found, which are referring to the event um, for uh, for George Floyd, um, and this is a strong indicator again that some to some extent social, societal and political events are reflected. So, um, for which we discovered is a rather unexpected variety of topics in this programming environment, and also controversial topics like the Black Lives Matter movement. And so, we want to know next um, how we can, um, yeah summarize it and see if the more controversial topics are also more controversially discussed in the comments, like in also in the social networks. And we also want to see um, if the comments are receiving a lot of positive or negative feedback um, because of the topic they are um, implementing or the implementation itself, so the code. And this would also be relevant for uh, computer science education point of view, and I will be happy to discuss um, some kind of these actions and go, um, also uh, get at feedback and advice for you later on. So thanks. Super, thanks, Isabella. Um, great, let's see. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, uh, Lucy, uh, Lucy Hunt from uh, Lancaster University. And um, also, is Maria Angela, is she also presenting to Lucy or is she it just... in the room, but she's not presenting. Okay, very good. Okay, so. So can you see? Yes. Hi, right, so, okay, um, so my name is Lucy. I'm a final year PhD student at Lancaster. Um, I'm also I work in the IT industry. I've been there 20 years as a software engineer and business analyst. And I'm presenting our paper on a review of how whistleblowing is studied in software engineering and the implications for research and practice. So the motivation 
In 2018, Christopher Wiley made re revelations about Cambridge Analytica's unlawful use of personal data. By contrast, at Volkswagen, concerns about software designed to mislead emission tests were not publicly raised. Harmful software has resulted in loss of life, societal and environmental damage, alongside economic losses from fines and sale embargoes. These stories, along with personal experiences, motivate our research. The goal of our research is to understand how practitioners and organisations make disclosures about perceived or actual harmful software or practices, with a particular focus on those who find it necessary to blow the whistle. We explore through three research questions. What are the prevalent whistleblowing themes? How is whistleblowing researched? And what are the gaps and concerns for software engineering research and practice? We looked for items specifically about whistleblowing based on the title, abstract and keywords. We performed searches on the IEEE, ACM and Scopus databases. We applied checks for software engineering relevancy and inclusion and exclusion criteria also applied. And that gave us 60 items from the last 50 years. Through two rounds of independent coding, we jointly came up with six primary coding themes as shown. Personal and social factors identified as the top primary theme and included sub-themes of individual values, personal motivation and the mum effect. The mum effect is described as keeping quiet about known issues or harmful situations and was found in students, practitioners and IT auditors. This is concerning given the complexity of software systems and our reliance on specialist technical knowledge to recognise support and evidence issues. Natural setting items featured most highly in the review. The majority of these were position, opinion and technology solution papers based on in-field reports or observations. There were also a significant number of scenario-based experiments contributing to our understanding factors that affect individual responsibility and intention to report bad news on projects. Software bugs, misunderstood requirements, system limitations, poor testing, outsourced work or third party code are examples of backstories to the scenarios. Situational factors such as professionalism, time urgency, harm of consequences and proximity to victims were shown to increase the likelihood of reporting bad news. One of our major research concerns was a lack of representation of teams, disclosure recipients and other groups involved with or aware of harmful situations. We therefore have some opportunities for future research. Studying modern software engineering stories presented as comparable case studies would help us map out and understand how whistleblowing escalates and how the wider software engineering community is involved. From emerging themes from these stories to be mapped onto existing social identity and whistleblowing models, for example, which could be useful for understanding the actions and reactions to harmful situations found in software engineering teams. Stories could also provide case studies for education and practice and help address the perception that reporting harm or wrongdoing is a matter of individual responsibility. And finally, some recommendations for practice. Firstly, to find approaches that can help a more timely identification and mitigation of harm. Secondly, to find mechanisms for improving the effectiveness and personal safety of harm reporting in particular to reduce the burden on individuals and organisations seeking to produce evidence in support or defence of whistleblowing actions. And finally, we look to professional bodies for support and advice for practitioners finding themselves in harmful situations. Thank you for listening and I look forward to your questions. Super, thanks uh, Lucy. Great, and uh, finally, we have uh, Alexander again. Um... Actually, it has Stefan rather than me. Because yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Can you see the screen now? Uh, yes. Okay. Very good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, hello there. I am uh, Stefano Lambiase, and I will present our work about the impact of cultural and geographical dispersion on community smell. Allow me to start with the context and the objectives of our study. First of all, uh, most of you already know that uh, software development has never been so distributed, 
and uh, this lead to the emergence of new social factors like the cultural and geographical one able to influence in various manner collaboration and communication in software development communities now various work has studied the relationship between these two factors but uh, in this specific work uh, we um, take inspiration by what Peter Drucker say, namely, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, and move from the qualitative field to the quantitative one, studying how cultural and geographical dispersion affect community community smell in software communities. Now, allow me to present the ingredients of our recipe. Uh, most of you already know the concept of community smells that have been used in our study to represent quantitatively collaboration and communication patterns. And so let's focus on cultural and geographical dispersion. <coughs> we define cultural dispersion of a development community as the degree in which developers form a community with different cultural attitudes. On the other side, we refer to geographical dispersion as the degree to which the member of a specific community work from different and distributed places in the world. As an example, if you have a community that is all located, that are all working in the same office, but that grew up in different places all around the world, you have a low level of geographical dispersion, but an high level of cultural dispersion. Now, let's move to the methodology and the results of our study. First of all, we define two research questions. The first one, to what extent are open source communities culturally and geographically dispersed? And the second one, to what extent do cultural and geographical dispersion within team influence the number of community smells? To answer our research question, we perform a quantitative study, starting from two data sets that already have uh, socio-technical metrics about various communities uh, of the GitHub platform. We computed the cultural and geographical dispersion metric for each one of these community, and we use graphical statistics to answer the first research question and built four regression models to answer the second research question. Concerning the first research question, our statistical analysis reveal that the GitHub present community with both low and high geographical dispersion values and also that uh, GitHub is not extremely culturally dispersed as one could expect. For our second research question, we decided to map the communication and collaboration pattern in four types of community smell, namely organizational silo, black cloud, lone wolf, and radio silence. And we built four regression models related to the dispersion matrix and the various other control variables to these four types of smells. Our study revealed that cultural dispersion is a relevant factor for the emergence of radio silence and lone wolf smells. And also that geographical dispersion is relevant for all these smells except them for lone wolf. More, is there, more interestingly, the influence is not only positive or negative, both for different and in the same smells. Now, to conclude, allow me to recall the title of our paper. So, good defenses make good neighbors, our study revealed that cultural and geographical dispersion impact communication and collaboration, but yet not necessarily in a negative fashion. So the answer is, it depends. Thanks for your attention. Sorry, Charles, I think that you are muted. We can't hear you. Yeah, that would help if I unmuted. Okay, sorry. Uh, thanks, Stefano, for your talk. Um, let's see. So, uh, so uh, time for uh, time for questions. We have a couple of uh, items in the chat that maybe we can we can turn to first. Um, both from Alexander um, Isabella. There's a question for you. Um, about the sentiment analysis, whether you uh, performed it manually or, um, or used a tool, and if so, which one? Oh, you, Isabella, you are muted. Yeah, you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Uh, okay. Oh my God. No. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Exactly one right. <laughs> so after two years of uh, virtual meetings, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So yeah, we did use um, an automated tool. It's called Wada. It's open source, but um, because those tools we used um, are not prepared or not in initially prepared for the, the the stretch domain or for children's. Um, sentences, so to say. So we performed a an manual analysis and we compared three tools. So and Wader was one of the best ones out of those three. So we decided to use um, that one. Uh, Lucy, there's a uh, there's a question for you uh, from Alexander. Um, uh, asking about uh, the use of sort of semi-private channels such as whisper networks um, uh, as a sort of means for whistleblowing. Hi. Um, yeah, well, um, we defined whistleblowing as internal or external channels, public or private networks. So yes, that would, would cover semi-private channels. Um, we found technology papers that have solutions that either protect that can protect whistleblowers. So there's there's definitely research around that. There's also papers that look to detect whistleblowing activities as well and technologies to, to do that side. So um, I don't know whisper networks, but I will go and find out more about it. Um, let's see. Good, uh, Stefano. Uh, there's a question for you in the in the chat here. Um, how accurate was the cultural uh, and geographical data used as independent variables? Uh, yes. Uh, thanks for your question. Uh, this was a uh, um, very interesting problem because uh, we rely on information about developers in the original data set. We have the information about the original country and also the working country of each developers forming the community. So we use the, uh, the Ofstedes framework, that is a framework able to assign numerical value uh, representing the culture of an individual basing, based on the origin country of developers. So we use the origin country, the offset framework, we computed the cultural measures and we use a standard deviation and other summary metrics to compute the cultural and geographical dispersion metrics. So if the information about the origin country was correct, and we assume that was correct, also the color dispersion metric was uh, reliable and correct. Uh, does that answer your question? This is from Bram. Thanks. Okay. Good. Uh, we have, uh, we have another uh, question in the chat from uh, from Lutz, um, uh, and this this is for uh, for Nan. Um, do you have a comparison with any other uh, context? Um, how motivations differ or are similar? Yeah. So uh, we haven't done the. Um the compar comparison with other uh, kinds of uh, other software foundations. And we know that uh, actually this is a very interesting question. So um, we um, yeah went through all the proposals uh, from this uh, project from Apache and there we often see that uh, they want uh, to develop um, under the Apache way. So, and so the, which also means that uh, uh, the important decision, development decision, uh, cannot be made uh, by only one single uh, organization. So, for example, it is uh, if it is uh, donated by a single company, then uh, Apache will actually uh, encourage them to involve more uh, companies or developers from different kinds of uh, organization to foster uh, the diversity of a community. But um, I expect that maybe for other kinds of uh, software foundations, uh, that have a different mechanism, so they might uh, uh, allow a single um, organization um, to do the uh, development decision. So then, uh, as a project, they might uh, have a different motivation to join different kinds of uh, 
uh, foundation. So I think it is very uh, interesting to do this comparison. So then the projects will know, uh, okay, if uh, we want to uh, develop or further foster the diversity, then we probably need to go to this uh, foundation if we still want to have the authority over um, the <laughs> project direction then maybe we should go to this foundation so then it is a very interesting question i think uh, to make the comparison so that the projects know uh, where they should uh, go okay. yeah okay, thank you uh nan it looks like you have another uh, question uh yeah. from Mohammed, um uh, asking about uh uh, possibilities or overlap between motivations um, for, for joining the, the, the projects and are there co kind of correlations between those motivations? Uh, yes, yeah, so overlap between pro uh, motiva motivations for joining the uh, project, yes. So we actually conducted the association mining uh, to check um, the correlation between the uh, motivation. So we found, uh, for example, the projects who want the um, want to develop uh, the community also would like to develop the user base. So we found a strong um, correlation between these two uh, motivations. Yes. Other questions? I have a question for uh, for Lucy. Um, I, I'm involved with uh, uh, teaching ethics in, in our computer science department, um, and and one um, one concern that comes up in, in ethics education um, is uh, the idea that um, we we tend to, we tend to talk about these sort of large big disaster stories. Um, the uh, you know the, the the space shuttle explodes and, and so on um, and uh, and the concern there is that uh, students in our classes won't um, won't connect with that I'm never going to be designing uh, the space shuttle so it, this doesn't apply to me so um, I'm wondering like you know within your work the degree to which you found uh, a, a difference between people talking about whistleblowing in a big you know, uh, it, 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 in a large sense, you know, the, the Facebook whistleblower testimony versus something smaller, you know, a, a, a smaller firm, but still an important moment where you have to sort of, you know, uh, make a decision. Uh, right. right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, certainly the work I'm doing now uh, beyond this paper is, is interviewing software engineering experts and getting those day to day project by project stories rather than looking at the big news headlines that people make, looking at the small differences people make. So talking to safety critical um, software engineering experts, talking to people that work in health um, and have to comply with standards and looking at decisions that teams make that they disagree with and how they suddenly start not to feel part of the team because they're standing up against something that the rest of the team is seeming to go along with. And whistleblowing may be internal, it might be just talking to somebody outside their team within the organization or as the, the whisper network, maybe you're going sort of down a, you know, talk to somebody else or talk to somebody else or do something on, on your behalf. Um, yeah, so my, my, so my future work, the work I'm doing now is capturing those stories and finding ways to present them, analyze them, present them, look at the escalations that happen, who talks to whom and why, is it a power relationship? Is it, you know, who's got authority to make changes, who can affect the outcome? So hopefully we'll have some, maybe some more practical software engineering stories um, yeah. in the future. Yeah, great. That's uh, let's see, I've got to keep track of the, the questions here. Um, uh, uh, Reed has a uh, question. I'm seeing some commonalities here about, about belonging and responsibility. Um, and uh, asking in uh, in what ways do you think th this is an open question for everybody? Uh, uh, in what ways do you think identity in influences action in software development contexts? Uh, yes, maybe I can start. Uh, so, uh, very interesting question. Um, Allow me to say that Ofstedes, Ofstede defined in his framework a metric, a dimension, 
called individualism versus collectivism that represent uh, the degree to which a member of a community tend to be uh, more a lone wolf or tend to integrate himself into teams. So I think that uh, such a dimension could be a, a good way to measure uh, in which way people uh, interact uh, in the way that you are questioning about. So from the cultural aspect, uh, that's what I think. I, I enjoyed Stefano's paper and the um, the different community smells that you find, the silo and lone wolf and radio silence and black cloud. I could see that in my participants, that they, they become isolated from a team or they're trying to speak up against um you know they don't they don't feel they belong anymore or they go along and do their own thing so um i agree there's there's definitely overlap in what we're doing um and how we how we look at the sort of social identity of an individual and what teams they belong to or what group they belong to and how that changes over time based on what they see um happening Others want to chime in on, on this question? Yeah, I just to, just to, just to add to it, I, I just thought it was an interesting trend here, right? Because I want to have the individual and collectivism thing, but also in the extreme case with the whistle blowing, right? That's an example where you know your relationship to your team, your company, or whatever is all subordinate to some greater good, right? Or the the you know the good of society or something else, right? So clearly these these relationships are malleable. But we also see that with the Apache Foundation, teams want to be part of something, right? They want to be part of this ecosystem, this foundation, right? And that in turn influences their actions. So that's why I was interested in seeing that this trend. Yeah, I think uh, there uh, in the Apache Foundation, we also actually uh, observe that, for example, Asia-based projects are growing. So which also means, OK, Asia-based project, they might see um, some representative uh, already in the Apache Foundation. So that actually attract them and um, help them make the decision. OK, we also belong to this uh, community. Yeah, definitely, I think it is uh, observable also in uh, Apache uh, Foundation. Let's see. Okay, great. Um, moving on. Um, question for Isabella and uh, Alexander. Um, did you observe differences between projects created by um, people of different ages? Okay, thanks, uh, Alexander. Uh, really good question because we were also asking us this question, not just uh, with the age, but also gender regarding gender. And um, people who are more experienced than others. But the main problem is that um, age, gender, and also the experience status, um, those are um, self-reporting categories. It's not mandatory to uh, see this um, publicly available. So we did some basic correlations with it, and we saw that uh, most of the, the, the projects we know the information is from 10 to 14 years old. Um, there were some, some outliers, of course. There were also people like in the mid 50s, um, which was quite interesting. Um, and we are doing like a follow up study on this uh, where we are mining more projects and gaining more information about it. Um, but um, regarding gender, um, we did another study um, with a smaller sample from a course we uh, implemented, and there we saw um, differences regarding the topics, uh, uh, gender, the gender, the specific gender is interested in. Yeah, that was quite interesting. It was um, also data driven. So, um, yeah. So there are, I so I think there are. Some um, differences, and there will be also regarding the age. Yeah. But really interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from uh, Daniela, and I'm going to let her ask it herself. Hi, thank you. Uh, I don't mind uh, showing my video and asking the question. Thank you to all presenters. Uh, throughout your presentations, I wondered and your work, if you consider the implications to diversity and inclusion in our software development environments, um, 
particularly the investigating global teams, Stefano, it seems that we've been thinking about diversity and inclusion for a long time in that domain. We're just realizing now, and we call it diversity and inclusion, because not only gender-based differences, but ethnic, cultural-based uh, differences come into play, the way people communicate, the way they, they feel included and, and they belong into a project, right? Uh, but for everyone else, you know, what do you think the implications are? How do we make these environments more inclusive? And I want to take it even further from an educational point of view. How do we teach the students and how do we nurture them to become developers, you know, and, and uh, with the mindset of, of being inclusive to those around them in their projects, whatever they are? Okay, let's just cut on. <laughs> so I, uh, with regards to the whistleblowing side of things, if we can be, I'm not encouraging whistleblowing, I don't think that's a good way for necessarily want to raise concerns internally before we take them externally. But if organizations, organizations show that they're open, about um, diversity and, and who they employ and leading by example um, rather than the whistleblowing stories like Tim Nick Gebru and others that are sort of shining a light on organizations for their poor practices. Um, I think that's certainly from the work I'm doing is looking at what what concerns are raised internally that we don't want taken externally or you know what yeah, something something around that. If I can uh, add uh, something to the discussion, uh, I think that it will be interesting to study the community smells that represent uh, in such a way, um, in some way, communication and collaboration pattern in educational uh, context. Because I think that if we are able to identify patterns in educational context, maybe we could provide to I don't know, managers, team leader, or other figures, instrument and methodology to, uh, uh, I don't know, take advantage of such situation. Because uh, it's important to know that uh, a lone wolf is not uh, a problem. You have to contextualize it in the context of your project to know if it could be a problem or an opportunity to have something more from your project. So from the educational side, this is my opinion about the, the topic. Yeah, so exposing students to these patterns in experiential learning projects and perhaps even best practices from, from the research that we do. Yeah. In, actually, in your paper, Stefano, there is a line about um, emerging skills um, might be potentially reduced by increasing gender diversity. So looking into that, I think it's Catalina et al. paper, um, so, so looking for research where it, it demonstrates um, yes, the, it is, the yes, value it of diversity. Is a, yeah. It is a young field, so more research is needed uh, in order to take advantage of such knowledge. And if you think about it, diversity is the first step. Creating an inclusive environment for a diverse team is the next challenge. You can have a diverse team, but the, the team may not, may not be inclusive. Of everyone's perspectives, right? That come with the different di with with the diversity. So creating that inclusivity um, atmosphere is is the next step. Yes, and that, and uh, I think that uh, we can do this uh, even better if we starting to do this uh, from the educational uh, field, because yeah. if we teach man future managers. To be uh, inclusive and uh, uh, so on, we in the future. I don't know when, but in the future, we will have a more inclusive community. Any other comments from the other speakers? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, so our next question is from uh, Lavinia. Um, it's for Nan. Uh, did you observe some of the effects uh, after um, after joining the Apache Foundation? Um, were they a diversified the community, or or, um, or were they able to collaborate 
Yeah, so that's a really a great question. So we actually try, uh, we tried to uh, quantify um, diversity, but we found it's very difficult because um, uh, after joining the Apache Foundation, many developers, they will switch to the Apache account uh, to commit their uh, code. And then uh, because we were trying to actually identify their um, information with the, uh, their GitHub account to see whether uh, the affiliation, um, uh, the number of affiliation for a certain project actually increase. For example, that they come in from different companies, but since they uh, many of them just switch their account to Apache um, account, so in the end you will just see the affiliation as Apache. So then it's very difficult for us to actually identify, um, for example, um, uh, the organizational uh, diversity. Um, so. It's a very interesting question. So I think uh, we still need uh, more time to think about, okay, how we actually can um, quantify uh, the, the diversity. Yeah, so if uh, you have any uh, suggestion, we would also like to uh, know. Uh, Alexander has a question for uh, Lucy and Stefano. Um, would lone wolves be more likely to be whistleblowers? matching the two of you up together. <laughs> uh, Lucy, do you want to so it, could work, it could work both ways. It could be the opposite. The lone wolf could be somebody that people speak up about because they're going against what everybody else is doing and just sort of plowing their own furrow. But they could also be having that authority and power to stand up or progress an idea, progress coding, whatever, without consulting others. Um, Stefano, what do you think? Uh, yes, I agree. Uh, and um, uh, in my opinion, it uh, could be interesting to study if a community with a lot of lone wolf, uh, so highly dispersed, uh, could present more whistleblowing events. Because maybe if we have a lot of lone wolf in, uh, the, in the community, maybe they can uh, group together and so lead to the emergence of more events. This is my opinion about that. Uh, let's see, uh, Nana, a question for you from Lutz. Uh, how many, how many uh, people did not end up becoming a part of Apache? So, um... uh, so we tried to collect as many uh, proposals as possible. So uh, eventually we got uh, 404 proposals and among them uh, 292 projects for which we can actually identify their status and they were first accepted uh, into Apache uh, Foundation. So for those uh, projects, which it means like around 100 projects, that we cannot identify their status, which means uh, most likely they were never uh, accepted into Apache Foundation. So, um, yes, yeah, so, but uh, we, we didn't know, uh, we only code uh, uh, the proposal which are uh, accepted uh, into F Apache Foundations. So we cannot answer the question whether the motivations uh, correlate with uh, the acceptance. Yeah, but that will be, uh, I think it will be also interesting uh, future work. Nice. Let's see, Isabella, there's a question for you from uh, Victoria. Um, uh, does your research have any implications for families and schools who use Scratch extensively? And um, I, I'll, I'll add a little follow on to this question. One thing I've wondered about, because I, I teach uh, uh, students uh, using Scratch and um, uh, there does seem to be a tremendous sort of uh, uh, privacy risk here in terms of what what young people are are sharing in terms of their projects. So um, answer Victoria's question any way you want, but I, but I'm I'm kind of interested in your in your, in your comments in particular on the privacy issues associated with it. Yeah. So um, first of all, I think it's it's good to know so for the educators and also for the families that. Um, regarding the comments that there are no really like f so mean behavior like hate speech or offensive um, behavior at all 
So um, I think that's good to know. But um, also in terms of digital uh, literacy, um, maybe we can do some cross curriculum um, learning here to to see in a really playful and um, easy way how social media works. So um, how also political and societal topics occur and how they are yeah how they are dealt with in the in the comments. And um, but for me the most um, the most um, or the best implication is really identifying topics um, that could be an effective factor for um, especially underrepresented groups for learning programming because uh, as you all know when you're really interested in, in a topic um, you really want to, to learn about it and you're really motivated so I think identifying those topics. Uh, could be a, a great motivator for for kids, especially to learn uh, programming, um, because they can do stories or games, whatever they like, with their topic. Um, and transferring from one media, for example, with the Harry Potter and Disney stuff, to another medium, uh, that would be great. And uh, yeah, with the follow-ups, though, um, if I understood it correctly, you mean on the on the Scratch environment itself, what they are sharing in the projects, right? Yeah, right. It, it's you know th these are young people, and they're yeah. they're sharing things, and they they're not really used to sharing things publicly, you know. And um, uh, uh, you know, yeah, it, it seems like a lot a lot of room for to get themselves in trouble. Yeah. So uh, we also saw this, um, especially when because we did um, also a uh, yeah manual evaluation of the topic analysis to see um, if it's like uh, if it's valid or not, and uh, especially for the controversial topics. So regarding LGBTQ plus um, topics, and there were a lot of non-binary. Um, kids or people in, in the scratch man they are also um yeah publishing a lot of their, their sexual preferences which is also some kind of documentation or learning for them but yeah we we saw this and we were really surprised to see this not only in an um for the young people that they have this these thoughts but also because it's a First of all, it's a programming platform, right? So it's not TikTok, <laughs> um, and that was really uh, we were really astounded, astonished by that. Yeah, but um, maybe there could be also some digital literacy aspect here to see. Okay, please don't share everything. Maybe. Um, yeah. <laughs> I I also do um, code clubs and Scratch with kids that are seven, eight, nine years old, and they love storytelling through Scratch. The idea they can create games and tell stories. I don't think they always get the concept that it can be shared. We try not to share too widely. We stay in a classroom environment, but um, yeah, I don't think they always are aware of what that what their after one sex education class the stories were a little bit colourful. And I was like, "What's happened? What happened?" I didn't know about this until afterwards. I asked the teacher why things had changed, and they're very honest about just putting out their thoughts and ideas. It's a, yeah, it's a different medium as well for them. It's not talking. It's them creating this something from their head that they've got got onto yeah. it into a game or something so. yeah totally and i also don't think they they see the impact they have and um, because also they can share their project they can remix it and and create something new and um yeah we saw also a lot of um what really was interesting a lot of um claiming that the, that they didn't um, cite the authorship so the original project creator this was also some kind we want to investigate um because they didn't um yeah cite it correctly in this way so yeah <laughs> it's usually when they find bugs and they can't fix them and you go well how did you write the code and they're like oh, yeah <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. so thanks uh, all of you for, for the input and the questions yeah <laughs> Uh, let's see. Um, Alexander's got a question. Uh, let's see about uh, um, about uh, copyright. Um, it, this is in regard to Scratch and and sort of pr programming environments for for young people. Is that is that the idea, Alexander? Absolutely. I'll let you. I'll ask. I'll let you ask this one. <laughs> 
exactly what what I was kind of wondering what was going on because I understand that kids bring Harry Potter and Disney stories into the world of Scratch. And then on the one hand, it's kind of cool, and maybe we need to talk to Warner Brothers and Disney and tell them, you know, you need to invest in programming languages such that they can play with their favorite characters as Scratch. But maybe we also need to say, you know, hands off of our pure programming with your commercial entertainment crap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Yeah, I think it's it's kind of complex because um, as you all know, sometimes Disney reinforces some kind of stereotypical um, thinking with their princesses and everything going on. Um, but at the other uh, side, we saw because they are interested in this stuff, so they they are liking princesses, they are liking Elsa and also Harry Potter, and then it's like as I said, it's a motivator for them. To, to program, so I think it's fine because at least they are interested and they are coding, they are doing something, and they see okay, uh, coding is actually really cool, so um, that's nice. And we also saw some uh, really nice adjustments of the kids, so they are like um, having the, the little mermaid. Uh, there were like um, uh, 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 Asian and a black. Little Mermaid, so um, that was really nice because um, Disney is now trying it also to do this, but the kids are they did it like three years ago, so um, maybe uh, one of brothers can learn from the kids. <laughs> cool. Any more questions for our speakers? Okay. Yeah. Um, great presentations. Great questions, everyone. This is really a, a, a wonderful conversation. Um, thanks so much, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Great, everyone. Hope you get the same good interactivity in your second session, whenever that is. <laughs> good luck finding it on the long program that we have. <laughs> enjoy. Thank you, okay. guys. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.